Aloha, and welcome to this episode of the Hawaii Smooth Jazz Connection. I am your host, Gwendolyn Harris. My guest today is a phenomenal contemporary jazz, R&B, and funk saxophonist, songwriter, and performer with a sultry and soulful sound. He has played all over the world at different venues and festivals. Some artists he has played with include Gerald Albright, Eric Darius, Najee, The Temptations, Gail Johnson, and the list definitely goes on. I am so happy to have him here with me today. Let's welcome Mr. Tony Exum Jr. to the show. Aloha, Tony. How are you? I'm great. How are you? I am well. It seems like, you know, I just saw you a few days ago, you know? I know. Crazy <laughs> how it works, right? <laughs> yes. So for, for viewers, I say that because I just came from came back from the um, Hampton Jazz Legacy Festival, and Tony was doing his thing. He was on stage with Nathan Mitchell, and they were doing their thing on the stage. Absolutely awesome. So I thank you for being here. You were in Colorado. Yes. So I thank you for taking the time to being here with me today. So let's get started. All right. How <laughs> How did you get your start in music? Um, I was about 11 years old. And uh, when I was growing up, I had a, a, an uncle, my mom's uh, younger brother, who was also a saxophone player. And, you know, I was watching him when I was real little, real small, you know, four and five. He went on to professionally with the Army as an Army musician. And so um, every summer when I'd come back to Colorado, I was raised in a little, few different places with my stepfather being in the Air Force. So I come back to Colorado Springs for the summertime, you know, so I could see my dad and see family, whatever. I'd always hang out with my uncle and watch him play, watch him perform, you know, outdoor concerts during the summer with the army band, you know, with the rock band or the funk band or the jazz group. And so one particular summer, he really just stood out. And I thought, man, I can do that too. <laughs> and so uh, I told him, I said, I want to play saxophone. I want to be like you. And he gave me his first horn. That was probably, what, 1986, 87, something like that. And so that's when I started playing. I was in middle school, uh, living in uh, Mississippi at that time. My stepfather was stationed in Keystone Air Force Base. So uh, that was home back then. And uh, I started playing in a school band and marching band. Eventually, uh, we moved back to Colorado Springs. And uh, that's when I got into my first jazz band at 14, in ninth grade. And I think I really got serious a few years later after seeing uh, David Sanborn and Al Jarreau in concert. Oh, wow. Yeah, my, my dad took me to uh, Fiddler's Green, a real big amphitheater outdoor venue in Denver, world famous place. Um, they used to come every summer. And I remember my uncle used to always go. I, I never went with him, he never let me go. He came back home one time with a tape and that was called Double Vision. It was the Bob James and David Sanborn. Mm -hmm. uh, a landmark album in contemporary jazz to this day. And that was my first tape, my first, you know, I'm dating myself, tape, <laughs> um, you know, of uh, that music that was mine. He bought it for me. So I listened to that thing all the time and thought I was grown, sitting up in my room listening to Sam Bourne and James, <laughs> Bob James. But I, I was drawn to the music at that point. So once I started playing in stage band in ninth grade, I wanted to learn how to solo, I wanted to learn how to play. And, so I started listening. I'd already been listening to jazz, you know, my whole life, but I kind of started taking it way more serious at that point. And uh, that's kind of how I got my start. So, you know, I played in all through high school, majored in music in college um, at University of Denver. Studied with some great musicians there, great, great, just incredible players, just to, just, you know, just, you know, he was always had a strong tradition of great, you know, uh, instruction in music great program there. So that's kind of where I got my formal teaching. After that, um, I was probably 18 years old. I started playing professionally. I started getting hired to do things, you know, playing uh, private stuff, playing uh, doing things in the studio with, you know, some local hip hop and R&B artists and getting a few shows here and there. Um, but I like a lot of artists. I started out, you know, playing on the weekends, working a day job, you know. Um, mm -hmm. But I, you know, as I got a little older, I started opening up for some major acts that would come through Colorado Springs, uh, mainly on the old school R&B tip, but, you know, enough to give me some experience in being in front of larger people in big stages, you know, uh, particularly the Pikes Peak Center right. here in town. Uh, my first big gig was uh, the Shylights and Delphonics. Um, 
<laughs> uh, and that was, uh, gosh, that was like 22 years ago. Um, year 2000 to be exact, 21 years ago. So that was the big coming out party for me, basically. I did a tribute to Grover Washington Jr., which was incredible. I only had wow. 15 minutes. I can only fit like two songs in. And so uh, I had some older guys I've been playing with for a while that backed me up. You know, we had to practice overnight because the other band that I was in, the leader got jealous that I got the gig. So he purposely booked the band someplace else. <laughs> so I couldn't use those guys. I had to throw a band together real quick to make this work, but his gig ended up getting canceled. So, you know, <laughs> I'll never forget that. We stayed up all night because these guys could play, but they weren't players like out there in the public like that. They just, mm-hmm. you know, they, they liked me. They were more like guys that did stuff in the studio. And uh, the drummer was an older cousin of mine that had been playing for a while. So I, dra- I dragged him and I was like, look, if you guys could do this 15 minute performance for me, it would be incredible. No, I'll pay you, you know, the whole nine. And so I went out there, you know, 24 years old, playing Grover. And after that, it was like, the name just got out there. I mean, people, I, have, I come from a big family in Colorado Springs, so people know my family anyway. But to see me on that stage, you know, in front of 2,000 people was, was big. So I kind of started the whole career, I guess you could say, as far as me considering or take it more seriously, me as an artist, you know, doing something like that. The very next year, I did the same thing, but by myself for um, Dennis Edwards and his Temptations and Jeffrey Osborne. Wow. And in, between that, in between that, I did some stuff with the Manhattans. So for some reason, I was getting all those opening gigs, which were some great opportunities. And uh, that really kind of <clears throat> started that journey, you know, kind of put the first few bricks in the road, so to speak, of, uh, of my path to where I'm at now. Wow, what an extensive, <laughs> what an extensive yeah. path. So I oh, can yeah. say, I can say that you're, you're, you're a, um, I want to say kind of like a military, uh, military brat, like they used to because I'm military. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm, a, I'm an Air Force brat. Uh, I'll tell you, you know. <laughs> I'm Army. I'm Army, so I'm not going to hold that against. <laughs> uh, I'm not going to hold that against you either. <laughs> but you know what's crazy? When I was in Germany, we lived in the stairwells, you know, it was both. It was Army and uh, Air Force. Yes. The same. Over there, yes. of course, two other places. Like even here, you know, there's Fort Carson, but then there's yep. Peterson Air Force, Air Force Academy, NORAD, Shriver. This is a whole military complex here. Um, actually, I think Peterson's now a Space Force base or about to be. So changing up a little bit. But yes, it's, you get the military lifestyle, though. You, you, uh, you understand yes. the process there <laughs> yes yes i do most definitely i do so tell me i know you play the sax what other instruments do you play any other instruments yes i play uh keys piano uh play some flute okay mm-hmm. so um, you, anyway, you pick up the bass just because i know a lot of saxophone players like to play bass because you know jared albright's an incredible bass player <laughs> uh, my man elon trotman is doing his thing on bass so i'm like hmm I, I really respect, you know, bass guitar. So I'm thinking about just just trying to see if I could do it. I don't know if I'll ever do it professionally, but, you know. Oh, you're, you're a musician. You know you can do it. You know you can do oh, it. Yeah. <laughs> you know yeah, you can do it. I've been on bucket list for a long time. So I'm, I'm like, just, just do it, you know, see what happens. So what music did you guys listen to in, in your household? In your household, what type of music did you listen to growing up? Oh, man, it was a little bit of everything. You know, when, my, when we were young, when I was younger, my we were in Germany. My stepdad used to buy records a lot more than he did when I got older. But, you know, when we moved to Mississippi, we had a lot of radio stations to choose from. So mm-hmm. it was a lot, of, a lot of good music, you know. Contemporary jazz, my mother was always into that. Uh, but I, I was into, like, Parliament Funkadelic and Slave. And, and as a little kid, like, barely talking, I could recite Bootsy's whole whatever. I could tell you, you throw on PP Funk and I'm singing along with it, you know. Spent hours and hours looking at them crazy album covers, just reading and, you know, soaking all that music in. And so, you know, early hip hop, uh, but a lot of, a lot of contemporary jazz, you know, a lot of Grover Washington Jr., Jeff Lorber Fusion, um, David Sanborn, George Howard, uh, Al Jarreau, Angela Bofill, you know, coming from my mom's side of the fence. Um, and, you know, just stuff that was out. I mean, Prince, Michael Jackson, the Jacksons, uh, I really liked Secretly. Um, 
I never admitted this before, but you know, <laughs> I think in the '80s we all kind of had a we started getting a good mix of music. So uh, I have to put Earth Wind and Fire in there too. Earth Wind and Fire was really big in my household. Lots of that. Um, let's see who else. Uh, hair bands that came out like I used to secretly really like Bon Jovi and and Def Leppard and Motley Crue, but I never told anybody that. You know. <laughs> Kind of dug that stuff, you know. I like I like electric guitar too, you know. I was a big Jimi Hendrix fan, and when I was a kid, only because they were they wore the costumes, I used to like Kiss. I just thought mm-hmm. it was cool because they had the wild hair and the, you know, the crazy costumes and Gene Simmons sticking his tongue out and stuff. I was like, as a little boy, they were like cartoon characters to me. So, you know, I still like Kiss, but only because of that. I didn't get into their music until years later, but. So that little bit of rock and roll in me too, you know, and uh, of course, as hip hop started to progress you know, in the 80s, I was really heavy into that. So um, as long as it was clean, I could listen to it in front of my parents, of course. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, big so, new edition fan, you know, the whole nine. So, um, you know, with this pandemic and, and I, it looks like we're after what I saw this weekend, you know, I know you guys are back out on the road now, which is amazing which is great what did you do because i know it was hard for all of you musicians entertainers during the pandemic time okay so what did you do during that time um to get through it you know to get through that difficult time what did you do uh it was a lot that i tried to do you know first i have to say that it was i I was referred to that period of time as uh the grand equalizer because it put everybody on the same playing field almost instant, almost instantly um a few things that happened in history that affected every human being on the planet in one way or another so i tried not to get too down about it what i did do musically though um and this is a complete blessing i released a single with Vandell andrew called don't run from love because we had been working on the song before the pandemic, and I called him up. I said, Van Dale, I said, man, let's just go ahead and put that song out. Why we, because we're going to be sitting here for a while. He's like, you think so? I was like, yeah, man. He's like, yeah, you know what? You're right. Everybody's dropping new songs. So, you know, I didn't want to be lost in the sauce, so to speak. So I said, mm-hmm. I need to put a new single anyway. So we released that. And um, while I, in addition to that, uh, I was able to, to, to work a little bit because with Colorado, a lot of the venues stayed open at like half capacity. Mm. or, you know, uh, or, you know, 30% capacity. So I had to scale down a little bit. I didn't always have a full band with me. I'd have like a trio or I'd do, you know, solo with tracks. You know, um, I got involved in this thing called Curbside Culture, which was uh, brought about by a company called the Cultural Office of the Pikes Peak Region. And so they picked like seven of us. So we want to try something. We want to try to offer live performances uh, to people on like a curbside. Like outdoors, it was during the summertime, of course. In other words, I could come to your home, set up in your driveway, set up in your cul-de-sac, your backyard, your deck, and do a, you know, hour, 75-minute concert for you and your neighbors, so to speak. Mm. So they set up a website and, you know, put us all on there. And it was like myself. I was probably the only national recording artist on there, but uh, I was like, well, look, while we're sitting at home, I'm going to work and meet some new fans and make some new friends. So I don't, I don't mind. Uh, you know, we're, uh, we were kind of stuck, you know, so I did that all summer and um, no touring. Of course, I did one big concert with a group called Dot Zero uh, at the baseball stadium. Uh-huh. That same thing in mind, uh, you know, that's a 6,000 seater, but we have a triple A team here in town, but we, they, 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 they limited to like a thousand seats. So everybody could spread out and they mm-hmm. had a big stage jumbotron the whole nine and it felt like a big jazz fest and so i did that on a friday night and i remember telling the band i was like i don't know when we're gonna do this again so let's have a lot of fun this might be the last one for quite some time so uh we had a good time with that and um that was pretty much it you know i just kind of worked my way around doing smaller more intimate shows um i was able to kind of sustain with that and it feels good to be back out on the road doesn't it I was having too much fun with, and you know, and Nathan and them are crazy. I was laughing the whole time. We were laughing the whole time. Uh-huh. It was like a big reunion. You know, we had, all of us hadn't seen each other in a while, mm-hmm. you know, and so it was good to reconnect, you know, with, with uh, my boys from Pieces of a Dream, you know, reconnect with Marion Meadows. Um, and Nathan and I got a chance to really uh, 
you know, talk and make some things happen. Seeing Will Donato again, hadn't seen Will in like, oh man, three years. So that was like a big deal, you know, same with Alex and, and Nils. So that was the thing. It was like a family reunion, you know, and, and we were all just kind of a little more jovial because like, okay, we're back, you know. Mm-hmm. And <laughs> I so saw good. that too. I saw, I witnessed all of that. It, it did look yeah. like it, it was, I, I was just so happy to see all of you together connecting mm-hmm. and, you know, it, it was just fun time. This is yeah. watching you guys connect, connect back together, I should say. Right. It, it just, it felt great. It's like, you know, it was really some dark times. I mean, you know, we all did things that we could as far as releasing music and smaller performances while, while the pandemic was in full, you know, a little stronger. But that idea of like what we're used to and how we're used to, you know, surviving. And it was like, OK, there might be we might be in some really new times. This could be a long time before we see that again. It was a lot of, you know, hurry up and wait. And I remember the first part of that pandemic, it was like, OK, stay at home six weeks. And then by summertime, it should be good. And then it just kept getting worse and worse. And there was more cancellations and postponements, you know, and, and hardly any touring, you know, especially in the smooth jazz community, very little of that. So it was really kind of like, well, what's going to happen? You know, yeah. and how are we going to navigate through this? So it's a big sigh of relief that we're able to get back out there. It just felt incredible. You know, and that was the last stop on a tour I had been looking on since uh, a couple weeks before that. I started out in Florida and went to Atlanta and the Carolinas are up to Virginia. So to cap that off with Jazz Legacy was just a beautiful thing. That it was it was a great experience. Like I said, I enjoyed watching all of you guys. Um, now there are many saxophonists out there. There's there's a lot of them. Tell yeah. me what sets you apart from everyone else. I think the one thing that sets me apart is the way I play soprano sax. Okay. I have, a, I have a voice on soprano saxophone that seems to be distinctive and, and has kind of set me apart. That's not necessarily through my own observation, but through what, you know, the industry has shown me. You know, you ask Will Donato, he'll tell you I'm like the next, he said, you're the next George Howard. <laughs> he always calls me that. He's like, every time I see him, he's like, man, every time you play that soprano, I just, I don't know what to do. You know, he just loves it. So I've been told that by other musicians and other, other saxophone players. So I think that's mm-hmm. the thing and I think I also have a different, um, I came up playing, you know, a lot of cover bands, you know, a lot of R&B funk, you know, top 40 stuff. So I bring that energy to the stage. Mm-hmm. Um, and so um, I think that's another thing, too. I kind of have that kind of R&B-ish kind of a swag, I guess you could say, to what I do. And I'm not the only one. I think I'm one of a few guys that kind of bring that, that energy to, to contemporary jazz. So we're going to play a clip here shortly um, in just a few minutes, but I want to ask you this question. Your latest single, is it Get At You? Get At You, yes. Um, it, it, it's climbing the charts, you know, and it features Desmond Motown Washington. Tell mm-hmm. us about that. Briefly tell us about that tune, and then we're going to get into that, that clip of you playing. Oh, man, that tune is just, it, I heard the track, and it's just, it just struck me. It was just it was funky, high energy you know just had a cool sound to it so desmond is a guy that uh, lives here in colorado springs who's one of the most talented musicians i've ever worked with uh-huh. you know, man, from, from motown from detroit and um i you know since he was 17 18 years old he was just a monster in the studio on the drums on the keys you know so he'd been wanting to work with me for a while so we put that song together and i wanted to feature him because i feel like he has a a voice that needs to be heard in terms of production. That's him on the piano solo on that song. Mm-hmm. And he's the one who produced the track. So I wanted to kind of give him a stepping stone in my world. He's already written for TLC, for Maxwell, for countless, you know, uh, gospel artists already. So he's pretty experienced, but not necessarily on the smooth jazz side of the fence. So he gave me a great tune. Lots of energy, makes you smile, makes you dance and do like this. And that's what I wanted. So we had a good time with it. So set up this clip that we're going to see of you playing. Okay, that was one of my favorite shows uh, that I did before the pandemic. That was the Winter Park Jazz Fest here in my home state, uh, Winter Park, Colorado. Uh, we were the kickoff act on the festival, and I had the great Will Gaines on bass, who you saw play for Marion Meadows. Mm-hmm. Uh, my guy and uh, some, some of my local players from out here in Denver. And this is a high-energy song, you know, real funky, and... We were just at that point midway through the show and just having a ball, you know. At that point, you know, it was like 90 degrees and everybody's dancing. We got 
thousands of people out there and all I saw was just a lot of positive energy. So that's what you're going to see in this clip. Okay, well, let's roll. All right. Awesome. See, I've seen you perform in person. I've seen you perform live and your shows are, are energy or <laughs> <are> high energy <laughs> Thank you. like that Thank anyway. But we just we just have a little bit more time left and I have a few more questions. And one of the questions is, what advice would you give new artists coming into this industry? I would tell them that <clears throat> none of the business part is probably the biggest part of your success. 
make sure that you're just as well versed on the business side as you are on your talent, your gift, whatever that may be. Singing, instrumentalist, production, you know, um, songwriting and arranging, producing, whatever that may be, or all of the above. The business is very much a biggest part of what's going to lead you to the path to success. It's 90% of it is business and 10% of it is the, the fun stuff. So be well versed on that and always stay humble. Um, be flexible and uh, be willing to learn and understand one most important thing. Your career is a marathon. It's not a sprint. It's going to take some time. So enjoy that journey, you know, and, and be steadfast in what you do. And you'll, you'll be fine. And my final questions are, what do I need to, or what should we be marking our calendar for um, <laughs> to see you? What projects do you have coming up? What should we be marking our calendars for? And the second part to that question would be, where can people go to find out more about you? Okay, well, let me get the easiest one first. <laughs> TonyEcklandJr.com is uh, my website. You can find out about me there. And of course, social media. So Instagram, Junior. And uh, Facebook, Tony Exum Jr. Music. If you follow me on those two pages, I keep everything you know, up to date on where I'm at, what I'm up to, what's on my mind, whatever the case may be. <laughs> as far as what's coming up for me, I got two more tour dates. So Dallas, Texas, I'll see you Friday at the Freeman Cafe. Then I'll be in Tucson with my good friend uh, D. Lucas on the 25th uh, at a spot called Brother John's doing a live concert with D. New single will be out by February 2022. And to let a little cat out of the bag, I signed my first record deal in October. So the new release will be on my new label, which is uh, BSC Recordings, a uh, Sony label based out of the East Coast. So awesome. For 2022. Well, congratulations on that. That is so Thank awesome. You. Thank you. Well, you heard that, everyone. And yet you heard, you just heard, you just saw a little snippet of him playing. So if you <laughs> want to know more about Tony, just go to his website, find out where he is and go see him. I've seen him play and he's phenomenal. I'm telling you that. Tony, I thank you so much for being thank here you. with me today. Um, and we're going to have to do this again. Mine. Yes, we uh, will. We can do a part two anytime you want. Yeah, I mean, we're gonna have to. I've done it. I've had to do part two to my shows for real. So okay. we're gonna uh, definitely, <laughs> we're gonna have to definitely do a part two. Um, okay. with you and Absolutely. you know I'll get with you on that because we're gonna do okay. one for sure. Okay. Sounds okay. Good to me. Thank you so thank much. Thank you. Thank you again so much for being here. All right. And to okay. my viewers and audience, until next time, aloha and God bless. Mm -hmm.